Hello, brothers and sisters. Psalm 9 says this, The Lord abides forever. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. As you gather up there in your home and you seek the Lord in worship this morning, I'm going to take a couple minutes and share some really important things on behalf of your elder team. As you know, we made the decision over six weeks ago to discontinue our weekly physical gathering as a church due to the COVID-19 crisis. Now, let's be clear, we have not ceased to be a church in any way, but we have been unable to gather physically. Uh, beginning next weekend, on the weekend of May 9th and 10th, there's going to be uh, really five worship opportunities for this faith family. The first is going to be this online resource. Uh, the worship guide, like this online, is going to continue. Uh, in addition to this online worship opportunity, there's going to be four service times that you can gather in person. It's going to be Saturday night at 6.30. There'll be a, two Sunday morning options at 9 or 11, and then a Sunday night option at 6.30. Uh, we're going to pursue the gathering, and at the same time, we're going to diligently, as a church, pursue safety by practicing social distancing. We're going to do that in accordance to our state and local uh, leaders and uh, their recommendations. But I want to say this, if you plan to attend one of those in-person gatherings, really important for you to hear this, limited, or in each of those services, seating is going to be limited. Um, and that means you must RSVP. Got to RSVP to go to church. I know that's weird, but it's necessary at this time. Hear the heart of your elders. I want you to do this. You can do you can do that online. You can do that through the app, but you must RSVP for you and your family. I also want you to know this. Those services are going to look and feel a little bit different during the season. We're going to be spread out. Um, we're going to enter and exit the building with great caution and care. Uh, some are going to be wearing medical masks. We're not going to pass an offering plate. Uh, if you're not feeling well in any way or you're physically compromised in any way, it's a better option for you to worship online. But as a church, we're going to have five different worship options. Some of you are going to continue to use this online resource. Some are ready to gather physically. But during the season, I want you to hear this. This is really, really important. Uh, we're one church. And you may, whether you choose to worship online or you choose to gather physically, we're one faith family. And we're going to pursue the Lord Jesus Christ together and continue to make much of Jesus. Now, this morning, uh, we're going to open God's Word together. Second Chronicles, Pastor Daniel is going to lead us through Second Chronicles this morning. The big truth is God continues uh, His activity in the life of His people, Judah. The big truth this morning is this. God is compassionate in His persistence and wrathful in His judgment. And as you're opening your Bibles there, I just want to pray James 1, over you as we prepare for worship this morning. May we prove ourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers only who delude themselves. Today we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. So go ahead and get your Bibles ready. Go ahead and find 2 Chronicles 36. Uh, you can download the notes on the app or the website to follow along. While you do that, I, I want to remind you of a story Jesus told. He tells a story of a man. He's a businessman, he's successful, and he buys a vineyard. And he puts everything in the vineyard that it needs to be successful, to produce fruit, to make money. And so he sets it up, but he has to leave. He's got to go to another business. He's going to leave the country. So he hires tenants to run the vineyard. And he leaves. And he leaves the vineyard with all that it needs to be successful in the hand of these paid tenants. And when it comes time for the vineyard to produce fruit, the businessman sends his servants to the tenants to collect. The tenants see him coming. At first, there's three servants. And the tenants beat one, uh, kill another, and stone another. Uh, they want to keep the profits for themselves. And so... The owner, the businessman, he sends more servants. And the tenants do the same to these servants. They kill them. 
greedy, holding the gain for themselves. And so the businessman thinks, I know I will send my son. They did not respect my messengers, but they'll respect my son. And so he sends his son. And as the tenant sees the son approaching, they say, look, this is his heir. Let us kill him and we will take his inheritance. We will keep the vineyard for ourselves. Jesus tells this story and he asks the Pharisees listening, what do you think will happen when the master returns to the tenants? What do you think will happen when the owner returns? That's a good question, and I want that question to be in the back of your mind as we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Uh, let's begin reading in verse 14. All the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. And they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. Chapter 36 gives us a summary of what has been happening from really throughout the kings. And again and again, the people choose to be unfaithful. Again and again, God acts in compassion and sends his messengers to proclaim his word. And again and again, they reject that message. And so we're getting a summary of this here in chapter 36. And so I want to give you our big truth. It's simple. It's right here in these verses we just read. God is compassionate in his persistence and wrathful in his judgment. God is compassionate in his persistence and wrathful in his judgment. We're going to break that down and see a, uh, just a few implications from these verses right here in verses 14 through 16. The first big idea, the first implication I want you to focus on, God's message, his word, is an act of compassion. Verse 15, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them because he had compassion. See, this phrase, sent persistently, uh, that's used in the ESV, in the NASB, it's translated sent again and again. It literally means to send them, rise early, and send them again. The point is God in his grace and his mercy repeatedly pursues Israel and calls Israel to himself. This persistent revelation of who God is and who his people are and calling them to himself is a remarkable act of compassion, especially when you pause and understand that Israel is a group of rebels. They're unfaithful. They're undeserving. They have not merited this. It is just the compassion of God, and it is remarkable. And so all the prophets, all the law, all the miracles, all these great and mighty works that we've been reading about from the beginning of 1 Samuel all the way through to 2 Chronicles, they all point to one central message. The God of Israel, he and he alone is the Lord. The Lord. And this message frames everything. We see that right there in the beginning of verse 15. The Lord, the God of their fathers. He is the one true God. And it frames everything else. It is the truth that we take refuge and find purpose in. Proverbs 35 says, Every word of God proves true. And he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. His truth. And who he is becomes our place of refuge. His truth provides purpose and defines creation. 
It is his revelation that lets us understand who he is as the creator and who we are as the creation. But it also calls for repentance and it calls for worship as we acknowledge who he is and who we are. And that's going to cause problems for us in our sin and in our pride. We're not going to want to repent. We're not going to want to worship. We're going to want to focus on ourselves. And so this is going to be a problem, and we've read the problem that this has been for Israel. And so the second implication I want you to see, the second big idea, God's messenger is an act of compassion. Again, verse 15, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion. This term messenger, it's used occasionally throughout uh, the Old Testament to refer to the prophets or like what we would know as kind of the formal prophets, the Isaiahs, the Jeremiahs. But it's also used for other situations and other people. It's even used for angels throughout the Old Testament. It literally just means ambassador or message bearer. And here the author doesn't use the term that we normally translate prophet or formal prophet, but instead he uses this ambassador term, this message bearing term. I don't know why, but I've got two thoughts. I think there's two reasonable options and I believe in them both. First, the emphasis here is on God, not the prophet. God is the one who shows compassion in his revealed word. It goes through the prophet, but the prophet's the vessel, the power, the anointing, the compassion. It's God's. And so we should even remember that today. Anyone who stands in front of you and teaches you God's word, preaches God's word, they're just the vessel. They're nothing. It is God who has compassion. It is God who is teaching. And it is God who is speaking. And I think it emphasizes God. Second thing that happens here is it expands the term messenger beyond formal prophet. I think that's really important. So in other words, we're recognizing that God shows his compassion through anyone who proclaims his word or his truth. In the New Testament, that idea is reinforced in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we hear that every believer is an ambassador of Jesus. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Did you catch that? The, the message frames our lives. We repent, we worship, and we no longer live for ourselves. In Christ, our life is his. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Catch that. The message has been entrusted to those who have been reconciled. If you have been reconciled, made right with God, then you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. You are now the messenger. Verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. If you're a Jesus follower, you're entrusted to be a messenger of compassion. God's persistent compassion proclaimed through you. And so one of the things we do here at Tri-Cities, we have a big truth and we've got big ideas. I, I've got a big question. It's a new thing. I'm just going to make it up for this week. It'll be fun. But i got a big question. All right, here's the question. What does that look like? What does it look like to be a messenger of compassion? 
And I'm so thankful that in Scripture, we don't just have a list of prescribed truths. God gives us narratives and stories that bring context and give us examples of what these things look like. And we see that right here in 2 Chronicles on display as the prophets are summarized. So when you think of compassion, what do you think of? Do you think of affirmation or encouragement or acceptance? I think if we're honest, we probably don't think of correction or rebuke or confrontation when we think of compassion. But if we don't, we must acknowledge that we're viewing compassion much different than the examples that are set before us in Scripture and are clearly described as compassion. See, our practical definition of compassion, I believe it is at odds with Scripture. And when I say ours, I don't just mean some general all the church around the world, although I'm sure to some degree that's true. I'm saying ours. Here at Tri-Cities Baptist Church, in our culture in East Tennessee, this is a stronghold for us. It is a broken and a, I think, an evil definition of compassion that rests within us that has devastating effects on discipleship. It's broken. And as a result, our discipleship and our teaching, it suffers Since I came back to East Tennessee, this has been probably one of the things that I come back to again and again, and sometimes I even hear it in myself, I sound like a broken record, but it is such a weakness for us in our culture. It's been ingrained into us, into our identity, into illusions of Southern hospitality. But if we're honest, we've got to recognize that some of the ways we define compassion is not how God defines it in his scriptures, nor the examples we see from his messengers. And so through this, just kind of in summary, I want to give you some marks of compassion in God's messengers. The prophets that we'll read about in the coming months as we read through the scriptures that were on display through First and Second Chronicles. First mark of compassion in God's messengers is The messengers of compassion proclaim God's word. They proclaim God's word. Again and again, they will say, thus says the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. See, the messengers of compassion did not just share their opinion. They didn't didn't just do the things even that they wanted to do or say the things that they wanted to say. In many cases, they didn't want to speak the word of the Lord. It was hard for them. It was difficult for them. But what they emphasized in their speech and in their writing was the absolute revelation of God in full, the encouraging parts, and the discouraging realities of our sin as well. Second thing, messengers of compassion persistently affirm God's authority. Here's an example. Isaiah 33. There's so many examples. I'm just picking one. Isaiah 33, verse 5, the Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge, the fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. See, regardless of what was going on in the world, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the message, God's messengers of compassion exalted and built up again and again God's authority. They affirmed his authority. They affirmed his sovereignty. And see, watch, this is how they encouraged God's people. This is how they encouraged the reader, by affirming God's authority. See, we tend to encourage one another by affirming man's ambition and the illusion of man's authority. Think of how many times you've heard things like this in those types of situations. You know, you be you. You got this. You you deserve it. Think about how we even turn those counseling words back to ourselves. I will always be there for you. I know what you're going through. See, 
these types of encouragement have a place. They have a place, but they're shallow. They're limited because our authority is limited. The messengers of compassion encourage by affirming God's authority. Regardless what is going on in your life, right now, where you sit, no matter what is happening, no matter what worries you have, you can find absolute rest in God's authority. He is sovereign and he is in control. And if you belong to him, he is working out every circumstance for your ultimate good, for his glory. Third, messengers of compassion persistently expose truth. And not just the encouraging truths of who God is, but the humiliating truths of who we are. And you see this throughout the prophets. Uh, just a few examples. Micah chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Hear, you peoples, all of you. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. These prophets of compassion in their compassion acknowledged Israel's unfaithfulness. They acknowledged our sin. They spoke openly about it. They didn't hide it. They were vivid in their description of Israel's unfaithfulness. That's important when we study this section of scripture. Any teacher, any preacher who would walk through this section and not unpack the vivid terminology that is used again and again, prophet after prophet, they're not proclaiming God's word. Instead, they're hiding parts of it. They're trying to make it uh, more uh, reasonable to your sensibilities. But these prophets, in compassion, proclaim the devastating nature of their sin and how God saw it. Ezekiel said this after taking the first part of chapter 16 and uh, just laying out all that he had done for Israel, how he had adorned Israel, how he had made a covenant with Israel, how he had given Israel just beauty and standing in the world. He gets to verse 14 and says, And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord. Verse 15. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. Your beauty became his. You took some of your garments and made yourself colorful shrines and on them played the whore like has never been nor ever shall be. You took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself images of men, and with them played the whore. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them, and set my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread that I gave you, I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey, and you set before them for a pleasing aroma. And so it was, declares the Lord God. And you took your sons and your daughters who had been born to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? Verse 38, And I will judge you as women who commit adultery and shed blood are judged and bring upon you the blood of wrath and jealousy. And I will give into your hands, or into their hands, I'll give you into their hands, and they shall throw down your vaulted chamber and break down your lofty places. 
They shall strip you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewels and leave you naked and bare. They shall bring up a crowd against you and they shall stone you and cut you into pieces with their swords. Jeremiah summarizes the same message in chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. The Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, Have you seen what she did? That faithless one, Israel? How she went up on every high hill and under every green tree and there played the whore? And I thought, after she has done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. She saw that all the adulteries of that faithless one, Israel, and I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear. But she too went and played the whore. God's messengers of compassion expose the truth, even the truths we don't want to hear about ourselves. And it is an act of compassion, says the Lord. Fourth, messengers of compassion persistently call for repentance. Joel, for example, in chapter 2, verse 12 says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Again and again, in compassion, the messengers of God proclaimed his word to the people, repent and turn back to me. Five messengers of compassion persistently point to Jesus. All these prophets point ahead to a Savior, to a Redeemer, to Jesus. Daniel 7 verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And these prophets that are prophesying there this time, there's around 300 specific prophecies that point to Jesus. And so there's been some interesting studies about that. Some statisticians, some mathematicians went back and theorized the odds of one person fulfilling all these promises stretched out over all these years. And they found that it is 10 to the 17th power. Now, I have no idea how to even say a number that long, but they help give context to it. Here's what they acknowledge. If you took silver dollars and you covered the face of Texas, the entire face of Texas, with these coins, they would stand two feet deep. Now imagine someone blindfolding you, walking you in the middle of Texas and saying, go find the one I marked. That is the odds of Jesus, of, of one person fulfilling all these prophecies. What an incredible testimony. And they all point to him. Final big idea. Rejecting God's compassion is an act of rebellion that leads to wrath. Verse 16, But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of God rose against his people, until there was no remedy. The messengers were persistent. They just kept coming. And as they did, they were commonly dismissed, ridiculed, marginalized, and persecuted. The, the term there, kept mocking in the ESV, it just means the ridicule never ceased. It never stopped. The mocking, the persecution, the ridicule, it never ceased. Why? Because these messengers exposed what was not wanted. The message that was proclaimed was not one that was wanted. People didn't want to hear that. 
They wanted a different version of compassion. Probably no prophet summarizes that better than Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 6, talking about the false prophets, the Lord says, For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. False prophets. Here's what they did, verse 14. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Sounds a lot like compassion. Verse 15, were they, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They don't know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Think about that for a minute. Which messenger sounds like a messenger of compassion to you? Peace. Peace, it's all going to be okay. You're good. Or you are broken and sinful. And apart from repentance, God is going to destroy you and overthrow you. You have committed an abomination before him. See, God's messengers never cease to be dismissed and marginalized and persecuted. Jeremiah at one point in time wishes he wasn't born. He says, all my friends have denounced me. Elijah felt alone. Ezekiel uh, lost his wife in an illustration of Jerusalem's downfall. God has him cook his food in cow dung. I mean, it is a hard life. Even into the New Testament, when we see these messengers continue, Paul says, all of Asia has turned against me. The disciples are martyred. And it's not just the messengers. Even the son is not respected and is murdered. See, we as messengers of compassion should take note. Uh, most didn't view the messengers of compassion as compassionate. Their life was hard. They didn't live in some self-care generation. There's no illusion of a uh, life crisis or burnout or retirement. Listen, it was the cost of being a messenger of compassion. It was hard. Ask a Jonah, he didn't want to go. Ask a Jeremiah, I don't want to speak. This was hard. You think Hosea wanted to marry a prostitute? These things were tough. The calls before them were difficult. Their life was hard. If I were to voice some of the things they voice in their laments, you would say, I need counseling, I need to stop. But for them, it was a Monday. It was hard. It wasn't easy. And so I think we have to ask ourselves some questions about the way we view being a messenger of compassion. And if our view of that is something like a high school class president who's popular and well-liked by everybody, where do you see that in Scripture? What examples of that do you see? See, could it be that our lives, our message more resembles the compromise and the unfaithfulness of Israel than it does these messengers of compassion whose compassion is defined by the very word of God? There's urgency in this too. We, as followers of Jesus, have been given this message of compassion and there's urgency. Verse 16 until the wrath of the Lord rose up against his people, until there was no remedy. Listen, God's wrath is coming. God's wrath is coming. Proclaiming peace and peace to those who are not in Jesus is not compassion. It's hate. It's hate. It's a lie. There is life in Jesus and there is death in sin. And when you breathe your last breath, one of these will be true. In Jesus, God's wrath will be satisfied. Or apart from Jesus, God's wrath will be unleashed on you. And there will be no remedy. I'm going to end the same way we began. I want to read you the parable of the talents from Matthew chapter 21. Jesus says, Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard. 
and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to its tenants and went into another country. When the season of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And again he sent other servants, more than the first. And they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him, and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And Jesus asked, When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? In verse 41, the Pharisees answered back, He will put those wretches to a miserable death. Apart from Jesus, we are those wretches to be put to a miserable death. To proclaim something else isn't compassion. It's hate and it's a lie. God is persistent in his compassion and it is on display through the proclamation of his messengers. Church, go be messengers of compassion. Heavenly Father, you and your word is good. Even when the truth hurt us, even when the message exposes us, you are good. Father, I pray that if there's someone watching this and they've never turned, they've never repented, Lord, they would see that there is life in your son, Jesus. They would experience your compassion. Father, I pray they would repent and in saving faith, they would follow Jesus. And Lord, for those of us who are in your son, Jesus, adopted into your family, Lord, may we be faithful messengers of compassion. And may our definitions not be watered down by the unfaithful worldview around us, but may it be encouraged and emboldened from your word. And may we go out and proclaim your truths, the goodness of your character and your promise, the power and the sovereignty of who you are, and the desperate need of man in his brokenness and his sin, who apart from your son Jesus will face your wrath. God, may we be your messengers of compassion. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Hey, church family, as you've read God's word this week and heard it taught today, we hope that you've been challenged and encouraged. God's word in our lives and the Holy Spirit's work always calls for a response. And oftentimes we need help discerning what that response is, and we would love to help. If you'll click the link below this video labeled Respond, follow the steps, a member of our team will reach out to you this week. We hope to see you soon.